you to everybody else who has uh, rejoined the uh, the webinar. Thank you for being here. And my thanks to Julia and to Elaine for all of your insights that you've shared so far. Um, it's been brilliant, brilliant to hear from you. So thank you for that. I've got um, a few areas that I'd kind of like to go back and, um, and get a bit more information from you on. And I would like to start, if I may, with the buy-in from the top. So we all know um, that any change programme, especially one of this magnitude, has to have the, the buy-in, the stamp of approval, the motivation, the, the passion, whatever, whatever we want term we want to use, but the person at the top of the organisation has got to lead it in order for it to be successful. I'm really curious to know throughout the, your experience so far with the Boost programme, how straightforward was it to get that buy-in from the beginning? How has it been to maintain the buy-in throughout the programme so far? Um, and I guess if you've got any key learnings, then that would be really useful in terms of things that have occurred to you that may have surprised you. There's some stuff that we're going to expect. What's surprised you as you've gone through this process with the, uh, with the people at the top? So I pick that one up as there as it's my sector. <laughs> so it was one of the learns from the pilot. So we set off on the pilot and we got about halfway through when this the whole issue of because we'd started with this reciprocal mentoring scheme and there were things that were starting to emerge. So um I was part of the change champion group and we met and it was it was actually the, the pilot was interrupted by um COVID. So towards the end, we were we were all um, virtual and we, and we met virtually. And there were all sorts of things that were starting to flow out from these discussions between mentors and mentees and barriers and whatever. And we were starting to think, well, what do we need to do about it? What do we need to do about it? And we, we realised that actually it was much bigger than just our change champions that we could do something about. So actually, as part of the change champion group, we pulled together a paper for all the chief executives and we did a number of asks of our chief execs from what was coming out of the pilot programme. One of them was that they met their mentor and their mentee and they had a conversation about the things that had been discussed and from the, you know, the mentor and the mentee, some of the barriers that they'd found in their organisation and what they wanted to do about it. So the reason for putting the mentee in the um, mentor in that meeting was to go back to one of the things that Julia talked about was that psychological safety, how safe it, it felt that it was a bit dangerous to put the mentee in there, but with a mentor that was had been hearing it, not from them, but from other people, their mentee that was in a different organisation, that would be one way of keeping it safe. So they, that was one, that's where it started from then. We also um, asked the chief execs for a commitment to actually do the ethnicity pay gap each year as alongside the gender pay gap. We said that was really important um, so we could actually see the gap and that, that it really highlights what levels people are at within the organisation. So that was one of the ways that we did it. At the end of the pilot project, our mentees, mentors and change champions went to the chief execs meeting. So Greater Manchester Housing Providers, as I said at the beginning, they're very, very collaborative. We all work closely together. Mm -hmm. And the chief execs all meet on a bi-monthly basis. Mm -hmm. So we secured a slot on their agenda and the mentees, the mentors and the change champions went and presented to the CEO meeting. It was incredibly powerful. And um, yeah. actually, just going back to the conversation we had, it actually happened on my, my daughter's birthday. Oh, did it? Right. Um, and uh, just hearing the voices of the people that <clears throat> in the programme, the mentors in terms of the things that they'd heard and they wanted to change, the mentees in terms of how empowering it was for senior white leaders 
to listen and want to know about their lived experience. And, you know, some of the things we've talked about already in the webinar about somebody telling you that when they walk in a supermarket, they get followed around by the security man. You know, those sorts of stories were very powerful. Um, and it was from that session that the chief execs signed up to fund Boost. So as Julia mentioned before, in terms of the knowledge um, partnership, they have to put money in as well as time and effort, et cetera. And in, this, in the actual program, when we launched Boost, a lot of the chief execs came forward to be mentors. In the pilot, they were more execs and directors, but actually once we got into Boost, a lot of the chief execs came forward and wanted to be mentors and wanted to get involved. So that's how we sort of have got the buy-in. And also, collectively, they keep each other to account because they, although we are very collaborative, they're also quite competitive as well. So none of them want to be seen to be behind where the others okay. are. So that keeps right. them moving along as well together. Okay, brilliant. So let me, let me add to that peer okay. accountability that peer accountability point. So we've really leaned in on that. So again, this comes from the value of having a partnership of organisations that are working together. First of all, some of the housing associations haven't signed up yeah. uh, because they're doing something already. Some of them are part of big nationals or what have you, they're doing something already or because it didn't seem like a priority for them. And actually we don't want people in the programme who aren't committed because that would mean that we're making our mentees unsafe. Yeah. So there has to be a kind of um, minimum buy-in, properly assessed, in order that you, you, you it relates back to the safety issue. Yeah. The we've we've actually leaned in on a bit of a peer accountability. So where we have had challenges, we have asked senior leaders to have very difficult conversations with other senior leaders. Okay. And uh, their willingness to do that has been really pivotal. That's massive actually yeah that's yeah that's that massive. really and is we're putting in two further pieces there's going to be an interview to come into year two and that's going to include reading back to them some of the data around engagement yeah. so we've kept record of who come to what okay and we're, and we're keeping accounts of how the mentoring relationships are going mm. so we're beginning to get an idea of you know where things are a bit more soggy yeah and that will be that will be spoken back to them by a senior leader in a short sort of um, um, introduction to year two, but on the other hand, are you really committed to this kind of conversation? Right, okay, so we're checking um, for commitment all the way through in that sense. We're also um, going to, we're also, because we've had a couple of racist incidents to deal with, we're actually going to take that to the group of chief executives, talk to them about it, talk to them about the, the, the challenges around safety. Right. So we're, and again, that's going to be led by other senior leaders. So really the buy-in from um, a, a small cohort of really, really committed senior leaders yeah. who are confident within a learning network, I think is, is, is going to prove to be very valuable. But Nina, I'm not saying that we've got complete 100% buy-in from at the top from everyone. Right. In the sense that I understand that some extent diversity competes with itself, which area of diversity you're going to look at this year kind of scenario. Yeah. But also, obviously, people have pulled away by a whole ranch of operational issues. How much this is dear to somebody's heart and actually legacy is an important word, how much is part of your legacy yeah. that the sector gets left in a, diff a different state. I think is really important. So we do need to keep working on the identities of our senior leaders mm -hmm. in order that they can continue to see this as important work. But the accountability is a really important point as well. Yeah, it really I, is. The accountability, there's, there's been some shifts externally as well that have helped us. Um, and it might be an unfortunate way of putting it, but when things like Grenfell happen, where there is a very clear lack of understanding about race where we had the damp and mold issue and um our ashab and that was there was a racist element that was highlighted in that um um what to call it um when they do when they do the review after a death what's it called oh the um so the po the post-mortem no, yeah no not the post-mortem no the, um 
the kind of virus and went to coroner's court and they uh, said yeah. you know one of the reasons why the damp and mold in that household wasn't understood is because the housing association didn't understand the ways of life and and also there was a major communication issue so the housing association took the view that actually it was a lifestyle issue that was creating the damp and mold rather than thinking you know we need to educate this family that haven't lived in a damp climate like the northwest of england before they need education they need support they need help it yeah. just been written off as oh it's it's a lifestyle issue it's nothing to do with us so those sort of issues externally have have meant the chief executives have got to take it seriously and also when they sit around that table as the greater manchester housing providers chief execs they are all white faces they can't get away from it it's no. scary. literally the evidence scary. It's the evidence is literally staring them in the face isn't it yeah. i think for, for one of the things that occurs to me as you as you both um contribute in there is that that we don't, it, there is a lack of awareness, but it's not on purpose. Oh, no. it's, I don't I don't believe for one minute that people are kind of blinkered on purpose. No. It's just that lack of understanding and lack of awareness that not everybody, um, we, we're all from different cultures. We all do things differently. We all, you know, kind of live differently. We, we eat different things. We practice different uh, rituals and, and religions, etc. And having that, um, I love that term actually, that I think it was Julia that used earlier about cultural curiosity. I absolutely love that. And that the kind of how amazing it would be if more of us were, were more curious about different cultures. Um, but it's That's really big interesting. Learning come out. A big mm. piece of learning is we need to learn more about each other's culture. And certainly from us as housing providers, we need to learn more about the needs of different communities and how they live. And, and we can only do that by having those communities working for us um, and being part of our decision making. And yeah, understanding. absolutely, which is, is the point of all of this. So that kind of the buy in from the chief execs was a big thing for me. So thank you for, for giving us some more on that. And we just had a, a comment from Nikki about the peer review process and how powerful that can be being held to account and, you know, feet to the fire from your peer group to say, well, hang on a minute. Why, why are you not as committed to this? One of the, the other areas for me that I think would be a potential concern is the sustainability of this, because we've kind of alluded to the fact that people have got busy jobs. So operationally, there's a lot going on. Um, they've got, we've got different elements of diversity competing with each other. Um, so like, all right, okay, well, it's ethnicity this time, but it's probably going to be our LGBTQ plus colleagues next time. or And we can work our way through all of the protected characteristics. So how do we make sure that a program like this is not just the flavour of the month? And it's what we're working on as a specific project now, but it, it becomes embedded in this is the way we do things around here. And this is what we look like around here. So that kind of sustainability piece, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And again, that was a learn from the pilot. We did the pilot, but then one of the things when we came out of the pilot was, well, actually, we could do this and we could um, um, empower and enthuse a small number of people and nothing happens. So again, we learned from the pilot that we, each organisation needed to have a project. They need to have a culture change project. It was deeply embedded as part of the programme. And the change champions um, from each organisation are charged with making sure that cultural change project happens and works through within the organisation. And then, as Julia mentioned, one organisation really took that on board and developed a boost strategy. So that strategy is what are they doing as a result of all this learning? And they came and shared it at one of our movement meetings. And we all thought, that is a great idea that each of the organisations absolutely commits to having an action plan around the things that we are learning, not just whatever project that they are doing in, over the three years, but actually that strategy of how they're taking the learning and embedding it in an organisation and shifting the culture to be more inclusive. Mm. So that's where we've sort of tried to build some of those things in. 
the other thing is the movement. So each year we grow the movement as more and more people get involved. And in those movement meetings, you can almost feel it's almost tangible and it's built up over the time of people wanting to make change. To go back to your earlier point about the chief execs, we did have a concern that actually some of them were not coming to the movement meetings because there was always pressing things in their diary. And that was the reason why we've now got this peer um, peer support there to sort of say, actually, I've noticed you went to two or three meetings. You know, what is more important than this? So yeah. those are all the ways that we're trying to really make sure that it is sustainable and it keeps yeah. going. And it's 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 part of how we do things around here for the long term. Yeah. So in a year's time, we'll to be able to tell you more about the embedding because we're about to go into this phase of it, asking each organisation to sign up to a commitment and to having an uh, to sort of going through a diagnostic and action plan process and to commit to that over the longer term. This is an innovation project; it's not a program. Mm, yes. And the uh, um, so we'll we'll be able to say a bit more about that. I mean, the data tells us that it is race and disability where we've got the, the 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 worst representation in housing and in most sectors yeah. so you know um um we, we we need sustained and we went and presented to the boards and we you know because another way of trying to get influence the boards are the people who hold the ceos to account mm -hmm. so we um and we said to them you know are you serious yeah you know, the challenge is always back yeah i'm not I'm not interested in being used to make you look as if you're doing something. I'm literally disinterested, actively disinterested yes. in being used in that way. Yes. So, um, you know, it's about looking in, in, in on yourself about whether or not this is part of the difference you want to see as you walk out of the door, the other side, you know. So I think it is about trying to garner that deeper attention. I'm trying to develop models of leadership nina and i'll just say it very briefly so i'm, I'm using I'm, I'm adapting a theory called complexity leadership and that would argue that we need two forms of leadership we need adaptive leadership and, and we need enabling leadership to make innovation happen now adaptive is about having those change makers all over your organization which is the point of developing your movement of allies yeah people who are going to and spawn change projects all over the place mm. now leaders need to then select the best ideas not just let all innovation go innovation is about you know making good innovation happen isn't it so good change happens so leaders then need to get out of the way of experimenting get things out of the way of the experiments but they also then need to select the best ideas and roll them back into the bureaucracy yeah of the organization mm. so that then they're mainstreamed yeah so we are literally changing we're seeking to change the way in which we think about leadership mm. so that it's integral to leadership yeah there's definitely not an adult. It, there's definitely certainly from from my own experience in conversations i'm having but also from a professional perspective talking about the culture of organizations that we are introducing candidates to because that's really important part of our process at intuitive we need to understand the culture that we're introducing somebody into um there does feel like there's a shift there is more of an acknowledgement that there is a need for a different kind of leadership we're definitely feeling that in the transport industry and um, where we are on that journey is a whole other conversation for another time but there is at least an acknowledgement and a start um to the to the shift that needs to happen um, we talked about change champions a lot as we've gone through, and it's absolutely clear from what you've both said that the people who are in those change champion roles are critical to the success of this programme. How were they chosen? Each organisation uh, chose their own mentor, mentee and change champion, although we did give them a brief of what that needed to be. So our mentors were senior leaders who were white, who were um, open to listening and learning and open to really carrying this forward. Um, our mentees were 
um, our ethnically diverse colleagues with the potential to move forward. Yeah. And it, as I said in the beginning, at first we were talking about our most senior ones, and then we realised that actually they weren't that senior. And although yeah. if you looked on paper at the data of um, the proportion of, of colleagues that were from ethnically diverse backgrounds, it looked as if they were well represented. It's yeah. actually when we delved into well, what levels are they at, at within the organisation, we realised that they were at the lower levels. And that was the reason for asking chief executives to do the ethnicity pay gap alongside gender pay gap. Right. With our change champions, what we originally talked about was um, somebody within your organisation that had a such a position that they could make change happen. And actually, we talked a lot in the first instance about them being HR type people, because yeah. a lot of the changes that we needed to, to make were in policies, processes, culture, that sort of environment. Um, so initially a lot of our change champions were the senior hr people within right. their businesses and um, but actually increasingly now it started to spread out a little more and actually one of our organizations one of their exec di directors was the change champion um because they they wanted to be in that position of making that change right what we initially said is that each year we would change all three roles We've actually changed that decision after year one to say, actually, we need some consistency. And um, so our change champions are staying in place. It's just our mentors and mentees that are changing going forward. Yeah. So with the with the mentors and the mentees, um, who who did choose them then? I understand that you you gave a brief um, and said this is what we're looking for, but who was responsible within the organization for selecting? I guess is the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is that when people were told that they'd been selected, um, were they excited about that or not? How did how did you communicate? And if you had to sell it to them, how did you sell it to them? We, we left it to each organisation to decide how they were going to choose their mentor mentee. In, for the mentor, I suppose it was easiest because it was usually a conversation in the exec room about who's going to do this and they decided between themselves. For the mentees, organisations took different approaches. Um, some organisations advertised the role and asked colleagues to come forward and then went through a selection and assessment process. Other organisations used their existing succession plans. So if people had quite well developed succession plans, they would actually select somebody from that. Mm -hmm. What I would say is that as Greater Manchester Housing Providers, we do have a number of mentoring schemes. And so for most of us, we do have people that have come forward and asked for mentoring in terms of their career progression. Mm -hmm. So actually for knowing who some of your mentors are and knowing that for this programme, we were thinking about um, ethnic diversity. We were actually then selecting people that come forward for mentors and the others, oh, sorry, mentees, the others yeah. went on the other mentoring programme. Um, so different organisations took different approaches okay. um, in how in how they actually did that selection process. Right. I wonder whether, and I'm I'm really going into danger now. I'm just asking all my own questions and nobody else's. So I need to make this the final one of mine before I move on. Um, I wonder whether the data is going to show any marked difference between how the organisation selected their mentees and the success of that particular person within the, the project itself i think i'd be quite interested because i just think that there is potentially a risk of choosing of, of someone in a position of authority let's say choosing someone who isn't but choosing them with an unconscious bias around why i think that person's going to be good but that in itself then excludes somebody else who might have, have really risen to the challenge but hasn't had the opportunity to do so so it's going to be interesting isn't it as as it works its way through to see what the difference is um if i can we have had some successes we've had a few that um have been promoted within the year and actually one of one of our most successful mentor mentee relationships was one where both have been promoted in the last 12 months one of our exec directors who was a mentor has been um, now 
um, successful in getting a CEO position. Um, and his mentee, who was a head of service, um, has been successful in getting a director's position. Um, and so, yeah. What so brilliant both, result that is. Yeah. And that is part of, part of the process, isn't it? You often find this in the mentoring relationship. The mentor gets as much out of it as the mentees yeah. in terms of making them think differently and their own career progression. Oh, absolutely. I definitely, I'm, I'm a mentor as part of the Women in Transport scheme and have been, this is the fourth year now that I've been involved with that. And I absolutely learn as much, if not more, as my mentees have. I love the process. So I definitely would agree with that and support that, Elaine. Um, Darren has asked us what commitments were made to the ethnically diverse colleagues that were invited to take part in the programme. The only commitment we made was that the mentoring, that they would have um, mentoring. We did ask them for a commitment to engage in the process and to engage in the movement meetings. Um, but yeah, that, that was that was the commitment that we made. And as Julia's sort of talked about, in the first 12 months, one of the things that we've really learned is the whole psychological safety. And that actually um, going into cohort two, that we're going to do some work with our mentees about psychological safety mm. and um, just giving them some more support around that because that is one of the things we've learned really coming through the programme, isn't it, Julia? We've had a number of issues that have been raised that we've had to deal with through the programme um, in terms of people coming forward. And I suppose in some ways, it's, it's like any other whistleblower in an organisation. It mm. actually, it's, it's a difficult thing to do but actually you do need people to do it so the organisation learns and get, gets better as you move forward. Of course, because otherwise we just keep shoving it in the corner, don't we, and covering it up and hoping it will go away and it isn't, it isn't going to go away. Um, I, think our, I think our commitment to um, our offer, if you like, the offer has grown as well yeah. as we've gone along. So the mentees are part of the movement, so they get part to be yeah. part of that community and to contribute um, and uh, to have some leadership opportunity within it. Um, we challenge our, our organisations to take on their learning and development as an embedded priority for the organisation um, beyond the mentoring experience. Mm -hmm. um, we considered giving some leadership training, but we decided instead that we wanted to support organisations to change their leadership training to be more inclusive and to include more allyship as a form of leadership so that it changes leadership training for white folks and for ethnically diverse folks yeah. so um we yeah so what the so and the offer also is that they can be involved in the change project which also gives them a leadership opportunity and some of them have taken that opportunity up more than others and we're going to look into why actually we're interested in, in why yeah so as we're sort of innovating the program as we go along, I think the offer is changing mm. somewhat. But I mean, we've got we frankly we start from a small resource base. Yeah, we've we've got big ambitions, but not that much resource. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I definitely think that the massive benefit, one of what you know, will be a, um, many many benefits to having the university involved in this project, is that the evaluation of it the learning that's that's happening all the way through the sharing of the knowledge and the learning and then the evolving of the project itself i believe would not necessarily happen and elaine you might challenge me on that you'd be very welcome to but i i just in the industry sectors that i've worked in i think that there is generally an evaluation of when some things happened but not to the extent that you seem to be doing it with this in terms of what have we learned what um, you, you mentioned earlier, um, Julia, it was around what's working, but not just what's working. And here's a list. Why is it working? And then how, once we know why it's working, we can start to apply that to different areas because we've not only learned the learning, but we've learned why it was a learning, if that makes sense. I think I'm tying myself up in, this, in knots. But um, we've, we've both mentioned there the terms at leadership and 
inclusion. Um, we've had a question from Nick around, can you let us know the benefits of inclusive leadership? This is quite a big subject and we've got um, just short of 15 minutes left to go before the, um, the full time whistle blows. So in your view, um, what, what, is, what are the benefits of inclusive leadership, I guess, in the context of what you're doing here? So first of all, I don't know if we're not going past further than inclusive leadership. So I worry a bit about the term inclusive leadership okay. and how it's being used sometimes. So and it'd be interesting to see who in the audience wants to disagree with me. And it's quite possible that it's being used in different ways in different places. So I am saying this tentatively. Yeah. But I think there's almost a danger that it removes the fight, the struggle and the politics of representing which are, are, are really difficult equalities issues within organisations by making it a bit too comfortable and a bit too polite. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I, I, I think that we are a movement. Yeah. We do need courage. We do sometimes have to act against our own best interests in the short term yeah. um we do need to hear some very unpalatable truths and i think that sometimes inclusive leadership is about a little bit of equality washing but also i'm sure there's a lot of genuineness underneath it as well but is the depth of the issue always really rising to the surface yeah so you know it's it's that that issue was as we professionalize edi if you like yeah. does it lose its activist roots mm -hmm. i've written down a bit too comfortable and a bit too polite there and i shall quote you on that julia because i think you might be right um i'm i am very aware of time and we've got some more questions coming through but i'm also very keenly aware that we haven't touched on the inclusive recruitment side of this so what have been the key lessons that have been learned from that change project that's focused specifically on that the things that stand out for you what we've been doing with the projects is various different organizations and have experimented with various different things so across the piece we've not all done the same things and um, as julie said this is very much about innovation and experimentation and adaptive leadership so different organizations have approached it in slightly different ways most of us have reviewed our recruitment and selection policies and practices but then very specifically organizations have experimented with different things which goes back to julie's point about what works and when does it work and why does it work? So um, in terms of some of the things that organisations have looked at, um, we've had one organisation that's been looking at the, their role profiles and actually the wording of that and how, um, in terms of, of role profiles, one of the things that that organisation has done is deeply embedded in the role profiles that actually one of the most important skills, so one of the things we're really looking for is that real deep understanding of diverse communities, um, okay. which might be a bit shocking to think that actually as, an organi as organisations that um, provide housing and build communities, that doesn't really exist. People look at technical skills and even behavioural skills, but not actually thinking about who those people have got that real deep understanding in the communities. So one organisation has been looking at how those, how, how jobs are presented, if you like, in terms of that wording to see if that encourages um, applications from more diverse candidates. Yeah. Another organisation has been looking at specifically the language of their adverts. So they've been using a, um, a software tool which is pulling out those words that are sort of more genderized or would put off people from different cultures. So they've yeah. been experimenting with that. We've had two organisations that have been experimenting with diverse interview panels. They've both done it differently for sort of different reasons. So one organisation has done it very, very formally where they have absolutely mandatory imposed diverse interview panels and actually had very clear role descriptions for everybody within that interview process and where the um, diverse member of the panel has a veto on the, the decision if they don't believe that it's fair and appropriate. 
Okay. The other organisation has taken a, a much more informal approach and is using diverse interview panels as a way of developing their ethnically diverse colleagues, as a way of giving them that experience, that knowledge. I mean, both organisations, I've been thinking about it from the candidates' perspective, have seen people like them on the panel, but really, really different approaches. Mm. And few organisations have introduced guaranteed interview schemes for um, ethnic diverse um, candidates that meet the basic job criteria and a, and a couple have really started to really push on the Rooney rule. So everyone's been experimenting. Next Wednesday, well, next Wednesday afternoon, all the organisations are coming together and each organisation is going to present on their experiment. They're going to talk about why they chose that particular thing to do and there's various different things. Um, yeah. as I say, different approaches and how where they set off from, yeah. where they ended up, whether it worked, whether it didn't and, mm -hmm. and then we're going to bring all that together and then from Greater Manchester Housing Providers we are going to pull that together as best practice. Actually one of the things I missed out, one organisation, well a couple of organisations have been um, looking at different assessments of candidates and also and um, we've all committed to in interview processes uh, asking diversity questions okay. but actually some of the learning of that is not to ask the question what do you think about equality and diversity but yeah. actually to do it in a far more subtle way about presenting um sort of as, as a scenario based question and seeing how people react to that and what their responses are so there's a, another organization that's presenting on that so Nothing like massively brown ground create um, changing and things that are best practice anyway, but actually really starting to look at that and look at what the impacts have been, look at um, yeah. how that works through. I mean, one of the one of the big issues that we've had is how we actually how we get out there to our diverse communities and attract them into the organisation. So what and that's one of the things that one of our um, one of our the platform that we're using housing for um, recruitment, because most of us use the same platform, is they've done a piece of work on how they can actually target um, our positions at more diverse communities, at more diverse candidates, yeah. and they're coming and feeding back and talking to us about yeah. that as well. So we've got a whole session next Wednesday afternoon where we pull all that together and Brilliant. then start to pull, pull through what that best practice is going to be. I shall definitely look forward to hearing back from you. I'd love to know how that session goes and what comes out of that. And you're saying, Elaine, that, you know, there's nothing particularly groundbreaking. But what occurs to me is that what, what isn't groundbreaking for some may actually be a kind of light bulb moment for somebody else. And I know even with the diverse interview panels, when we say to our clients how important that is, that you have diversity in your panel please don't sit there as as kind of three white men let's have let's put some thought into this um and and quite often i will have immediately the objection or the obstacle which is well i don't have any senior colleagues who are from an ethnic background a different ethnicity to to the, to the rest of the panel so well, it doesn't actually have to be a senior colleague this is an amazing development opportunity for somebody else in the business to feel like they're being involved because their view matters and they have got a different view by virtue of their lived experience which is really in the valid. nhs in the northern care alliance they've got a model of uh, uh, cultural ambassadors because I mean, I know as a woman who's brought in on a panel, that it's not always easy to represent women on that panel mm. because I'm not necessarily being given empowered to do so, yeah. right? And I might be given the diversity question; it might be completely ignored in the evaluation of the candidates. Mm. So, but they have a they have a, a formalised system of somebody coming in to make sure that things are both safe and that diversity is taken seriously within. The, within the recruitment process. So yeah. they've literally trained and developed some mentors who, who um, uh, uh, have, have that scheme. So there are a range of, you know, you know we're interested in sucking in these innovations. Yeah. Um, uh, I've got a colleague who's doing a PhD with me on inclusive recruitment who, who, were, who re until recently worked in the NHS called Donna McCoughlin. Right. And uh, she's looking at, you know, what's really valuable and what gets valued 
in the interview process. Mm. And this comes to me saying, you know, the number one I want thing I want to see is that leadership interviews, interviews with leadership roles, take seriously an understanding of diverse communities and the people who can bring that that that's something that is genuinely valued mm. in the recruitment process yeah. not just asked about but genuinely valued yeah um, and equally people who haven't got it it's genuinely noticed <laughs> so no, that goes noticed. back to that, that piece of experimentation about we should value that deep knowledge of our communities in the same way that you value a technical skill and um, the other thing that a lot of organizations do is change the wording on the adverts um, yeah. to say, if you don't feel you meet all the criteria, please still apply and let us make the decision whether you do or you don't. Because yeah. we know that, um, you know, women and people from ethnic diversity uh, backgrounds actually will not apply. It's a confidence thing. So we actually put that wording out now that says, you know, if you're not sure, just apply anyway and we'll make yeah. the decision. Yeah. Um, and that has actually changed. Yeah and um, just just some of the candidates that have applied yeah i feel like i want to share very very quickly um an idea which came from a conference i was at in manchester a few weeks ago <coughs> where there was a fabulous lady called jane hatton whose business is a, a, a job board which is specifically people with disability so organizations um, are encouraged to post jobs on there if they are looking to increase the diversity in terms of disabled colleagues and one of the things that we're aware of, certainly from a neurodiversity perspective, is that not all candidates are comfortable with psychometric tests or with any kind of test. And also they hold back from applying for roles because they don't want to go through a standard interview process. They might have had one before and it's been horrible. Um, and Jane's suggestion was that on the, on the job adverts, that there is a sentence on there which says, we want to help you to shine during this interview process. Please let us know how we can help you to do that. And I absolutely love that. That's not kind of, you know, are you disabled? Yes, no. Do you need any reasonable adjustments as part of the interview process? Yes, no. Because I'm going to say no, quite honestly, because I don't want to make it hard work for you before we've even got there. So for me, that whole wording of that, because we, we're taking you through an interview process. Why would we waste our time and your time putting you through something if we didn't want you to do really well? And this is the other thing that John Lewis are doing is to, they're sending the interview questions out to candidates. Oh, before yeah, we the do interview. that. Yeah, we that always is, do that. Oh my goodness, this is so enlightened because yeah. it's not an exam. It's yeah. an interview, it's a conversation. Tell us about all the great stuff you've done and how you can help our business by bringing your talent to our organization so there's so much gold dust in there we've got so many more questions to ask but i'm one minute to go we're at 1629 i'm not known for well, this time can i invite people if they want to learn more about boost if they want to meet our mentees mentors and change champions and hear more about our inclusive recruitment uh, experiments that we, we are running an event on the afternoon of um, June the 21st at the university. And it will be going up on the Good Employment Charter website soon, but we can circulate that link okay. because it's actually Good Employment Week and the EDI is the theme for Good Employment Work Week this year. Um, and so we're really interested to share that. And if anyone on the panel thinks, yeah, we'd like to do this, but I need to influence somebody, if you could bring them along to that, then that might be a way. That would be amazing. Of getting them used mightn't yeah. they? is that in the university julia are you holding it at the yeah, university? Free event. yeah 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 fantastic this we, afternoon we will push that out through our social channels too um right. because that sounds i know i don't think i can get to it because i'm on holiday but um i see it make sure that a member of the intuitive team can go along to that because there's going to be so much to learn so that's brilliant thank you for that massive massive thank you to both of you i could seriously sit here for at least another two hours because i've got so many things i want to ask you um so a huge thank you for me thank you to everybody who has joined the webinar who's contributed to the chat room i apologize if i didn't get to your question but i do um, i'm really confident that you will have taken something away even if i haven't answered your specific question i'll put that to the uh, to our two guests so all that remains to me for me to say is elaine and julia i'm huge 
hugely grateful to you both for giving your time, sharing your knowledge, sharing your experience. And I will definitely be keeping in touch because I want to see how this progresses and what lessons we can learn to bring into the UK transport sector to help us um, reflect the good work that you're doing in social housing. Huge thank you. And thanks for listening. <laughs> thank you very much. Take care. Thank you.